This is the Champions Rugby Show. I'm Martin Hindley. We're celebrating 25 years of what is now the Heineken Champions Cup by speaking to the legends of the game who have written its history. And today I'm with a real star who, in the year 2000, reigned supreme with the Saints. Well, there's one of the great moments as this huge trophy is handed over to Pat Lally, European Cup winners. He was the captain who inspired the Saints to victory in the Heineken Cup two decades ago. He masterminded one of the tournament's biggest ever shocks as coach of Connacht Rugby. And he's now the director of rugby of the Bristol Bears. And he's doing a mighty fine job on both the European and Gallagher Premiership fronts as well. Joining me today is Pat Lamb. Welcome to the show, Pat. Hi, Madam. Thanks for having me on. We're going through your Heineken Champions Cup story over the course of, of this podcast and what a story it is. But first of all, just a word on what you're achieving right now uh, before the pause with the Bristol Bears. It's been quite some season so far. How have you enjoyed it? I very much enjoy my, myself here. Uh, I think very similar when I went to Connacht as well. We I needed clarity on the vision. I wanted to know what we wanted to achieve. Obviously, the club was struggling. We'd been in the championship for many years, and when I arrived, it had just been relegated. So we just set out a clear vision, clear plan, and we've just been working away. And it's just probably what the pandemic has shown as the how far we have come as a club that a culture that you build for the tough games like the Heineken Cup games, like, you know, you, when you're on the field, that you you want to be able to look left, look right, and and dig deep for for the, for the cause, you know it's actually coming to fruition. Our culture through this pandemic, the way that everyone's looking after each other, the way that we're still communicating, and and that's what it should be about. It's like a family, you know, a family's there for tough times, and and we're certainly in those challenging times right now. We see that that culture stretches not just from the the training paddock and uh, and on the on the field on match day, but also in uh, in your supporter base and the way that your fans have bought into what you're trying to achieve as well. How important is that to you as well as to to Bristol Bears? Because there are some similarities there with with what you achieved in in Galway as well, aren't there? It's a massive part of what we want to do. You know, the the vision was very clearly to inspire our community you know, through rugby success, what we do on and off the field, you know, we want to create inspiration. Where is that community? I mean, obviously, Bristolians, where are they? They're, they're everywhere. They're all around the world. And I knew that when I got the job, a lot of well wishes um, from everywhere saying, you know, they're right behind me. And then, um, and then, of course, you know, within the Bristol community, there's um, people from all over the world. So there's a lot of people that we can inspire by what we do. And, and so we put a lot of effort into what we do on the field and off the field. And community is a massive thing. The amount of work players and staff do within our community. And we get that back twofold by, then in turn, the community, similar to Inconic, getting behind the team, supporting the team. We saw that in record numbers, um, you know, attending our games, um, massive supporter base, season ticket holders. We, we broke records there, sponsorship. Everything's come back, and and that's largely because of the work that everyone, players and staff, have put into uh, into our community, and, and we've 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 reaping the rewards, and and obviously the hard work we do, and the rugby that we play, and the style of rugby that we play, uh, also helps in uh, in inspiring the, that community, and certainly a trophy, which is you know obviously. You know, the ultimate, we set our goal very clearly. We want to be a Champions Cup team. We want to be a team that's always in there challenging for it and obviously winning it. Let's go back to when you first came to England to play rugby back in, in 1997, having been in New Zealand uh, with Crusaders and then swapping that for something very, very different in Newcastle Falcons. I mean, how what do you remember about how it came about and, and how you settled into to things up in the northeast? Yeah, well, I was actually on tour with uh, Samoa. I was captain of Samoa. We were, we were on a trip, and and while I was in one of the games, I think we were playing a, a friendly game against Oxford, and I was I wasn't actually playing that game. I was getting a rest, but uh, Dean Ryan and uh, Steve Bates um, was were there in their Newcastle jackets and asked to have a quiet word and if I'd be interested in coming up here, and and I said yes, yeah, certainly. And then Rob Andrew came over when we played Ireland at Lansdowne Road. I think we, it was a night test, first ever night test, and. We put 40 points on Ireland, so it was a good time to play well. 
And um, Rob asked Brian Williams, the legendary Brian Williams, our coach, if we had a down day, if uh, he could bring me to Newcastle and have a look around while we're on tour. So he did that. And I was really impressed, again, impressed by the vision with Sir John Hall and what they wanted to achieve up in the northeast. And, um, you know, prof- rugby had only just gone professional. And, you know, again, very similar to um, I was inspired by that vision about you know, really making a difference in the north part of England, you know, where rugby wasn't as strong. And so I, I came over at the end of halfway through that year. They're in the championship. We we won the championship, and the following season we won the premiership. So um, that's how it all began. Uh, you know my, my journey over here, and it's uh, it's you know it's been a fantastic ride so far. Did success help you to to settle in England? Uh, I mean, personally as well as uh, as on the field. I think the big thing was that the team that Rob compiled. Uh, with players that have played a lot against them, you know, in, in, in international rugby, you know, Gary, obviously my, my good friend Inga Tugamala signed a week after I did as well. So that made it easy. And then we had, um, you know, Dottie Ware, Gary Armstrong, obviously there's Rob and Dean and Batesy, uh, Alan Tate, the, the list just went on. And and um, so we had an older group, an experienced group. And and obviously Rob and uh, Dean were, were player coaches as well. So, we had a really good culture, but the team was certainly a very experienced team. We had young the following year. We had a young schoolboy join us, Johnny Wilkinson. Um, he wasn't and, bad. Uh, yeah, he wasn't bad. I remember Rob saying, "Oh, we got this young fellow coming in. We can just make him welcome. He's just out of school." You're thinking, "Okay." He walks in there and he's so respectful and everything. But I remember the first time um, he was holding a tackle band. I did one of my runs and he whacked me, and I thought, "Wow, this guy's got some." He's only a young fellow and wasn't much of him, but he could hit. And then you looked at his skills and his dedication and realised, I remember saying back to uh, my friends in New Zealand, I said, I think England's got a, someone here who's going to be a superstar. He's the closest to a Southern Hemisphere 10 that I've seen. And, you know, the rest is history, really. But it was a, it was a wonderful team to come into, very experienced. And, of course, we, you know, we, we dominated their championship year and then we, we had a fantastic run in the premiership. You mentioned what rugby means to Bristolians. You also um, know what it mean, meant to the people of the the northeast. The the success that you had. Did you look at last year's Heineken Champions Cup final in Newcastle and and see and the England Test match against Italy uh, and all of those kind of things and think that's what the city deserves? Without a doubt. Funny enough, that that, that trip I go back to when I was on tour summer. I remember I've never been to Newcastle. Rob actually took me, uh, now that I look back and I know the city very well, he took me to a very nice part of Newcastle. He took me to St. James Stadium. And I looked at it and said, oh, wow, is this our training ground again? This is a football team. Um, But he says, you know, we've got a good relationship there. Obviously, Sir John owned the football and the uh, rugby, very similar to uh, Steve Lansdowne. And he said, this is the dream. This is the dream that one day we're going to be playing here and, and, you know, growing the game. And in that Heineken Cup year, I mean, watching that game, but also uh, there was a game Newcastle played Northampton. I was asked to do commentary and I went there and it was full. And I said, this is exactly the dream that I was told was, uh, was, was all about. So it was fantastic. And, you know, it was really sad to see Newcastle go down, but I'm so pleased they're back. And, uh, and hopefully they can get through like everyone else through the pandemic because it's vital. You know, the, um, I thought I played my best rugby in Newcastle because once again, you just get to know the community and you need to understand what you're playing for. Because in the old days, you just play for your, your your club, your school, your province, your country. You wouldn't change in the amateur day. You wouldn't dare change. But once professionalism came in, there's no reason why, even though money was involved, you needed to find the reason why you're going to dig deep with five minutes to go and, and really push yourself. And that's getting to know your community. You've mentioned the vision and sort of the inspirations behind a couple of the the clubs that you've been with in this interview already. Um, what was it about the Northampton Saints vision that attracted you there when uh, you put pen to paper to move from from Newcastle? Well, funny enough, there was no plan at all to go to Newcastle uh, to Northampton at all um, after we won the Premiership, and you know things went well. Um, you know. I, I, the day before I left to go, to, I had to go down to play for Samoa and test in our test series, our, our uh, June internationals. And I was coming off uh, the back of, um, you know, there was the Premiership Award that got voted Premiership Player of the Year. You know, a lot of congratulations. Shook my hand with Rob and said, "Yeah, great, mate. We agreed that, you know, I wanted to extend my 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 oldest son was just out of school. We love in Newcastle, so away I went." thinking that my next three years are going to be at Newcastle. While I was down there, I got a phone call from my agent saying, wow, well, congrats, uh, you're going to Northampton. I said, what happened there? I said, what happened to Newcastle? And he says, no, no, it's great. You know, um, Northampton have paid a, a record transfer fee. The money's going to Newcastle of Soldier to Northampton. And uh, I couldn't believe it. I said, I want to go to Northampton. I want to stay at Newcastle. 
And um, but he said, no, no, you, you got triple your contracts tripled. I said, I don't care, I want to stay there. And so, as it turned out, and it was it was difficult to take initially because remember we had just come from the amateur days, and all of this new, was new. And and you know, obviously it's a it's it's an everyday thing in football, but for rugby back then, in context, it was it was an unusual thing to be sold. And it took me a while to get a buy it. And, you know, Rob and I had a fallout on it and we ended up getting, but the good thing is, you know, three, four years later, we actually, because our families were close, we sorted it all out and I ended up coming back to Newcastle. But it was a blessing in disguise because the guy that actually bought me was Ian McGeekin. So begrudgingly, I headed down there, but it it was another level. I probably wouldn't have been a a coach if I hadn't gone down there because Geech, um, I learned another new game um, and a way of doing things. And Geech mentored me and asked me, basically told me, brought me here to help out the culture because they had some quality players at Northampton, but, you know, they were underachievers. They were struggling. And his vision of where they wanted to be, he wanted a real culture change and felt that I could make a difference being an outsider and, uh, you know, having some influence in the group. The Premiership clubs were back in Europe in um, 1999-2000, but still, as you went through that campaign, as a group of players, did you believe that you could be Heineken Cup winners? It was always Geech's dream, you know, when we came in, when we talk about the vision, you know, he wanted, you know, he felt that Northampton could be a team that could win the Heineken Cup. Um, and when I went there, the way that he, uh, his vision and the way he wanted to play the game uh, was was unbelievable and the way we could play and we could play some really good rugby. So that first year there when England, when the English teams weren't involved, um, it was ironic really because we won, obviously we, we were we had just qualified and with Newcastle and, we, and now we weren't going to be playing. But I was now with Northampton. But we, previous year, they had only come the highest they finished with eight and we, we were right, we ended up second and we qualified for Europe. But that year was a fantastic year. We just missed out on, it was the first pass to post, I think, in those days. And we just missed out to Leicester. But we were playing some unbelievable rugby. Geech ended up going to Scotland. Um, and he had a meeting with his, uh, he called it his Magnificent Seven. Uh, there was Gary Pagel, um, Tom, Tim Rodber, Paul Grayson, Matt Dawson, Nick Beale, myself. And he basically said, told us he was leaving and then talked about, you know, he was involved in bringing in a new coach. Now, there were some big names he mentioned, but we were all of the opinion that we, our year before, we were playing some rugby that we had really good understanding with. And we didn't really want to change that. And um, the other option was uh, an unknown rule, but no one to the club was John Steele. So we all agreed that if we could bring John in, and then, you know, a lot of us could still run a lot of the stuff that was going on and the way we could continue and develop the way we are playing. So we came into that year uh, very confident that if we could get a really good run, that we could be successful and, you know, get to the next stages. And once you, we always said, once you get to the finals, you know, you're, you're in with a chance. When you go about your your day to day job these days, do you see a little bit of Geech and a little bit of John Steele in the way that you approach certain things in rugby? Certainly, a lot of Geech. Geech has been a, a massive mentor to me. When he took me under his wing, and and I still even my last year of playing, he brought me into the Scotland setup. So I had a coaching contract and a playing contract, and then he, um, but he his man management, but his his way of thinking about the game really challenged me you know, around continuity, around angles and lines and getting them behind the defence line and pouring through, you know, um, letting the ball carry determine where he wants to go and the support read read him, you know, where... Um, so I learned so much off him of that and um, and certainly when I was coaching, we, we played Yorkshire Leeds in the Championship uh, my first year at Bristol and Geach was there involved with Leeds and I asked him to come and talk to the team and... Uh, you know, we, we, we won convincingly, but he could see a lot of the. He enjoyed the way we play. And I said, mate, you realise that's a lot of stuff I got from you. And I asked him to come in. He was a little bit shy initially, but it was massive for our team when Geech came in and spoke to all the players. You know, they, they uh, a lot of respect from. So in the quarterfinals of the Heineken Cup, you you have a ding dong with Wasps and you edge that one. And then you do it, uh, you do it again against Clinetley in a, a relatively high scoring game. You're in the, the Heineken Cup final uh, at Twickenham, the 27th of May. 2000. Um, what do you remember about the build-up to to that match against a monster that was emerging in Europe rather than the the monster that we we know today? Well, I think one of the things, and it's it's really again to re-emphasise the importance of what I do now as a coach, the culture of our group. You know, if I go back to why Geech asked me to come in there and work with some guys and. You know, we our, our culture of our team completely changed from where we had cliques and different groups and we all did things together. I remember holding a 70s party and, 
and we did everything. We're going to have a party. Everyone's invited. It's it's that held us that held us in great stead. I mean, we weren't the we weren't playing the best rugby or whatever, but when we you think was you know it's uh, twenty two all and we get a penalty, we win twenty five twenty two. You know, Kinethley we're down by about 10, 12 points, and we you know we fought our way back and. And Paul Grayson had a kick on the 83rd minute at 28 all, and we went 38, 31, 28. We got to the final, and we were pretty beaten up. A lot of us had injuries. Um, there was guys, Dawson, Matt Dawson was out. Uh, Nick Beal was out. You know, and we knew this is the last game. You know, we were fighting on three fronts. Uh, we lost the cup final to Wasp. We were stroke. We just managed to qualify to, to get into Europe for the next year. And then this, we knew, was just one last effort. But one of the things I knew is that our culture would bring us through if we get into, um, you know, right down to to the wire. Um, and nine eight. I mean, it's, when I look back and I, I think of my time, those three finals was a great example. Get to the playoffs, but you're going to need culture. You're going to need leadership, and you, you know, to get to to make sure your game can uh, to get you through. What inspired you? I mean, the BBC report now talk, talks about you being a man inspired, charging through tackle after tackle. I mean, what made the difference for you that day? Was was it all in culture, or was the or was there something else around the match day? Well, obviously, as a captain, there was, um, and you know, Northampton and Bath were the only one who'd won it as an English club, and you know, the, the Heineken Cup was the ultimate. And this is everything we had talked about, and we got here, and we knew. I, I think we only trained once, and even then, it was hard because we, we were pretty beaten up. But I remember uh, on the wind. Well, my son, my fourth child, was born on the Wednesday. He was actually due on the day of the final. And I mean, hey, once we knew we we're in the final, um, I said that, "Look, you got to prepare. I won't be there because we, with my, me and my wife, we have home births, and it was planned." And I said, "So we we had a contingency plan, just in case I wasn't going to make it. But if it came down to the final or being at the birth of my son, I said I'd be there." Thankfully, he arrived on the Wednesday. And when you have a home birth, so my wife took no painkillers. I remember saying at the time publicly, you know, and I was there and it was touch and go about my shoulder. But what I saw, the pain she went through to deliver, you know, and obviously it all goes away once you, 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 your child is born. And I was, I was thinking in that build up, I remember my quiet moment was all about my wife and, and my son, Josiah, having Josiah. And I said, if she can do that, I can do this. And it'd be very, well, not, I shouldn't say similar, but I knew that if I put all the, put everything into it, at the end of it, there's going to be an unbelievable prize that we'll enjoy. And there's, and plus, a, uh, you know, a two month break before we have to play a game where I could get some surgery and sort that out. So I remember just going, I've got, just got to go for it. And if it goes, it goes. And thankfully I got the ball early and just went for it. But Lums feed. Right down in the field, and after his whistle goes for the end of the match. Northampton have won at last, and well, you can see how thrilled they are. Pat Lamb has been superb, you know, he's been the catalyst for Northampton going forward in this afternoon and a magnificent season by Northampton. When did it first sink in what you'd uh, what you'd achieved as you as you had your hands on the, the European Cup? Um first of all, I remember Munster supporters were unbelievable. They were they were, you know, as well as the Northampton supporters at the ground. I thought, geez, I've never seen an away. You know, they were obviously desperately disappointed to lose and they were a fantastic team. I mean, remember they, they, they beat Saracens twice, you know, and they had an unbelievable semi-final against Toulouse. So they were certainly the favourites. But they, they, I think it was 40,000 uh, Munster men came over, but they were unbelievable after the game and, they, you know, had a real affinity with Munster after that. But I remember going back, we went back to um, uh, Franklin's Garden and, um, you know, all our fans were back there and then we did the street parade and that's probably where it really kicked in. You know, you realise we've done something special, a club that's first major trophy in 127 years, I think it was. You know, a small town in Northampton, which which really is, is a little bit in the middle of nowhere. It was surrounded by other places. It was voted not the prettiest place to be. But what we did as a, as a group to inspire that 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 town and, um, you know, the memory that we have from that was awesome. And, you know, it was uh, a real privilege to be part of that. And, you know, on, the, on, you know, on my own journey, I'll, I'll always have fond memories of it. So yeah, a hero in your in Newcastle, a hero in Northampton, and I want to take you back to your time out west in in Ireland as well, where you continued your incredible history with uh, what is now the Heineken Champions Cup, and a day in 2013 in particular, victory in Toulouse with Connacht. Take us back to that time and and how you how you pulled it off back then. That was a massive highlight for my coaching career. Always will be because. You know, coming to Connacht, you know, you got the team with the smallest budget in the Northern Hemisphere and 
And one of the reasons why I took that again was the vision. You know, they they sold the vision. They wanted to be the best Irish province in five years' time. When I got there, I quickly realised, you know, that everyone didn't know that vision. So, you know, that was still front and centre. But what we determined again was about inspiring and grassroots, the green shirts, and come through. But I remember um, there was a lot of change that needed to happen there, and you know, certainly in mindset, certainly in the way we wanted to play the game. And the week before uh, the game against Toulouse, we 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 lost to Edinburgh and Murrayfield, but the, it was the way that I was. I remember having a real go. I don't have many goes in the change room, but the last ten minutes, I think we we conceded three tries, and uh, I was gutted. I was disappointed, and but I, what I did is I went away from that and I said, well, I got to change this defensive system and give more clarity around it. And um, the next game was Toulouse and Toulouse, which, we, you know, they hadn't lost for five years in, in Champions Cup rugby. But I remember bringing everybody in and we went through it all and we talked about the – we had a really good plan on how we could do this. And uh, we started off really well. We had a try, an outstanding try disallowed by – you know, they looked at the TMO four or five times. They said, surely, come on, you got to give this to us. And and we didn't get it. And a lot of things – but, again, we were right there at the, at the end of the game and uh, – uh, we had to hang on, and and that defensive passage at the very end to get it done. I think everyone started to tune in. I think uh, from other channels to watch what was they couldn't believe what was happening. Connick, you know, no way they could beat Toulouse in their home ground. And um, I, I mean, you only had to see the the reaction of all of us, myself included. I don't get too emotional after games, but that was certainly one because of who we were, where we were at our journey, and that was massive for belief that win for us as a group over the next years that we could always reference that we took our game to that level. But for us to get to become a team that we ended up being a few years later, we needed to understand the consistency we needed to be at that level, consistency of the way we train, prepare. And it was a massive moment for Connick Rugby, obviously the game itself, but certainly for us as we started to grow, we would always reference that game and the standards that we hit and we wanted to beat those standards. The whistle's gone! in the Heineken Cup in the Stade Ernest Ballon for over five years. What a game. What a special day in Connaught's history. They've held on. Well, we said it was David versus Goliath and David has won. What an incredible performance by Connaught and so richly deserved. Do you believe that you managed to make in winning the Pro 12? And I'm thinking of sort of like key moments in, in European matches like the clock in the red zone uh, against Wasps, for example, uh, in Galway. And you had the leadership from, from the likes of, of John Muldoon. Do you, do you believe that you were able to craft on the field a reflection of yourself and your own career, in a way? I think one of the things that I've learned, and you know, it's in my philosophy, is that there's, there's three non-negotiables um, in rugby that I've learned because I've been very fortunate to be in some very successful teams as a player and as a coach. But I've also been very blessed to be in some, some not-so-great teams, some horrific teams. And one of the things I come away when I, I look at and do my comparison, I quickly realise there's three things that are non-negotiable. And um, I probably realised this even more after my time at the uh, the Blues when I got sacked, and and is that you got to have a really good game, a game that can beat anybody, any team. And I'm not talking about the players or the individuals. I'm talking about your game, um, how to play the game. And you can't think, you know, you got to look at well, who's the best team in the competition? Can we beat them? Who's the best team in the world? The All Blacks, England, South Africa? Can we beat them? You know, can my game beat them? And then you bring the players and to be able to come up to the game, which means you've got to have good staff to skill them to come up and play the game that you want to play. Um, and we, the second thing, culture. You can have a fantastic game, but if your culture is not great and people don't enjoy being there, it's never going to work. Likewise, you can have a fantastic culture. Everyone loves being there, but your game will only win certain things. It won't win championships. And the third thing, which is just as important as leadership, you know, if you um, aren't – developing leaders, bringing people through. You want a place that's not reliant on any individual. It's not reliant on Pat Lamb. It's not reliant on Charles Piatel, Robbie Henshaw, Bundy Aki. You know, if, if they leave or move on, it's, uh, you know, they, they've added to it and they move on and the next people come through. So wherever I've gone, those are the three things that I work, you know, and when, I, when Steve Lansdowne asked me to come to Bristol, I said to him, the you know, Firstly, I wanted to know what his vision was, so to make sure there was a line, because if it wasn't, I wouldn't go. But secondly, secondly, I wanted to make sure that he 
understood what I actually do. And I said, if you just want me to coach rugby, you got the wrong guy. You know, I said, I need to have a massive involvement and influence in game culture leadership, which is what he gave me here, you know, throughout the whole organization, because it can't be that the first team do this and the staff and the, uh, the academy do something completely different. Our values, our, the way we do things, um, our culture has to go right through the whole organization if we're going to be successful. Um, and that will hold you in great stead. The culture is for when you're under pressure. Relationships is for when you're under pressure. You know that you can be honest, you can be true, you can be challenging, and you can also own your own uh, your own actions. The structure is obviously really, really vital to you. Does that help to replace the different emotions that you had as a player? Now that you're a director of rugby, yeah, it does because I think as a player, you you know you. It, playing is easy. I remember <laughs> you just rock up, you play, you, but, you know, it, everything that you do is influenced by your coach and the management team because, you know, you you can't come and say, I want to play this way. You, you go to a team and the coach wants to play a certain way. You can talk to him and influence, but ultimately it's his game that you're trying to play and he wants you to play a certain way and you've got to get on and do it to the best ability to be selected. But you're always asking. I was a little bit of a pain in the backside for some coaches because I always was – I was a why person. I wanted to know the big picture. And if he gave me the big picture, then I'd ask, why are we doing this drill? Why are we doing this? Why are we doing that? Does that, where does that, why is that? And if they couldn't give me an answer, that's how I sort of used to judge coaches. I said, oh, okay, he's just, he's a, uh, a YouTube. Well, we didn't have YouTube in those days, but he, you know, he's a copy coach, you know, but I wanted to always ask um, those questions because, um, you know, certainly as a player, um, you're, you're influenced by those around you. As a coach, you're trying to uh, flip. I try to flip it around and as if I'm coaching Pat Lamb, the player. <laughs> and uh, I, don't, I don't want that pain in the backside coming and asking me the why. So I'd rather give them the why. I'd rather give them the, this is the big picture. This is what we're about. This is giving clarity. And I think that's what players want and that's what staff want. That's what everyone wants. They want absolute clarity. And I would always say that, you know, Certainly when I do recruitment and retention, I give everyone the big picture because I say, I'm not asking, you don't have to come here, but I want you, if you do come here, have a real understanding of what we're trying to achieve and then everything else makes sense. You know, whether that's, oh, we're having a a, a barbecue here or, or we're having a, um, going bowling or, we, or, we, or we're playing, or we're doing this sort of drill. They can all understand where it all fits in and that's why I give every player and staff my coaching philosophy so I don't want them trying to guess oh, what's Pat Lamb like what's he doing why is he doing that I'd, I'd like it all out in the open then everything else makes sense in the business end of the the Heineken Champions Cup it, it's often said that you need to lose a big game to win a big game if you like it, is is there something about losing a, a, a high octane European match that can give you more um more strength in terms of the leadership that's required to succeed or, or even the the culture or impact on the culture of a club is that something that you found in um, in your career? I think it's more you learn from every you have the opportunity to learn from every experience, every, every life experience, um, every uh, success and every failure. Yes, certainly when you you know if you lose a final, you you know it hurts more. Um, every experience, every individual, you know goes through certain emotions. What I try to bring it down to every time, regardless of win or lose, is ask yourself, what have I done well here? What could I do better? You know, that question of what I've done well reinforces, hey, don't be hard on yourself because you're actually good at what you do. What I, what, what I could do better is all about your growth. If you only focus on what, I could, what I've done well, you miss the opportunity to grow. So you come off a game and you've won a final, you want to say, oh, we're so good, but you don't actually go back and say, well, what, we, what could we have done better? You know, and then vice versa, you know, um, you, you lose the game. And rather than just on oh, what we could have done better, still acknowledge what we've done well here. And those, a team will always get better if you have individuals getting better and individuals will get better if they're asking themselves those two questions, regardless, it might be their drive. You know, what have I done well in this drive? It might be a talk that I've had, you know, with um, um, with, the, with the junior academy, having a chat to them. You, you might ask yourself there, the training, everything, always asking those two questions daily helps you grow. If you do that, every experience will, will make the difference in you being a better rugby player, but also you contribute to your team or your business or whoever you're with. Improved individuals improve the collective. What would you say is is your legacy to date in the the Heineken Champions Cup? And um, with all of the things that that you're you're talking now about your philosophy with Bristol Bears, what do you still want to achieve in 
Europe's premier club competition? I, th- I think what happened, like, I'll be honest, when I arrived up in 96, I didn't really know much about the European Cup. It obviously just started, you know, obviously everything was super rugby had just come in, but before that it was all rugby in the Southern Hemisphere. When I arrived, I remember when we won the uh, 90, uh, 96, uh, when we won the championship, you know, the first glance I got, I think, Breve won. And I thought, all right, geez, okay, this is massive over here. And then I remember the Bath won the year we won the Premiership at Newcastle. Bath won that, and that was a massive thing for English rugby. And so it, it sort of painted some real realisation as you, you know, I spent six years as a player and then coming back here. The Heineken Cup, the Champions Cup, is the ultimate in European rugby, Northern Hemisphere club rugby. So it was no coincidence when I came to Connacht and then to Bristol. You know, they were all about, you know, people were talking to me about survival, about avoiding relegation, certainly in Bristol and mm-hmm. Connacht. It was about, you know, being the best Irish team. And I was like, I set a goal. No, it's, it's Champions Cup. That's the standard. We got to be in there every year. When people look at a club, they look at Connacht or they look at Bristol. I wanted to think, Oh yeah, Bristol. You know, in, in 10, 20 years' time, yeah, they're, they're, they're the team that's they're a Champions Cup team. They're the team that wins the Champions Cup. They're the team that dominates Europe, and and that's the standard. I want them looking higher than that. You've certainly entertained crowds, not just uh, in Bristol, but fans from across Europe with your performances in the Challenge Cup over the last couple of seasons. Um, just wondered, you know, at the end of a European day, what still makes you you smile and and feel like you've you've achieved something special. What makes you you happy in those adventures? I just think it's fantastic to play the other teams. You know, people, oh, there's always the argument the premiership's the better, top 14's the better, um, or pro, pro 14. You know, this gives us a chance to play across travel, play those teams and, and one-off teams you don't play every time. And I, I believe it's the next level down from from test match rugby with the players that you, you train and be with every day to go on those sort of battles. To go to France is never easy, and to win in France is always a massive celebration, even though it might be a pool game, you know. And um, you know, and, and for coaching, it's, you know, for players, it's fantastic. But for coaching, being able to, you know, you tend to analyse and know a lot about the tendency of teams in your own competition, but then to say, OK, we're playing Toulouse, you know, this is going to offer us different challenges. So it stretches you as a coaching group as well. And we enjoyed our time in Challenge Cup. And, um, and I've enjoyed my whole experience in, uh, in, in, in European rugby. Pat, it's been an absolute privilege um, to take a walk, not only down memory lane, but also into your philosophy and, and your style as a director of rugby. Thank you for all uh, the, uh, the entertainment that you, you have given to us and continue to give to us in European club rugby. And we're looking forward to plenty more uh, once this current situation passes. Thank you very much to you, Pat, and all the best to you and to all at the Bristol Bears. Yeah, thanks, uh, Martin, and uh, stay safe, everyone. God bless. A fascinating catch-up there with a legend not only of European club rugby's history, but also its present day, too. On culture and philosophy, on Newcastle and Northampton, on Connacht and the Bristol Bears, and on that day 20 years ago when he lifted the Heineken Cup for Northampton Saints at Twickenham. Please subscribe to our Champions Rugby Show podcast. There's plenty more from where that came from. Leave us a review as well if you enjoyed it in particular. And let us know which players you want to come on the show next to share their stories of a quarter of a century of history from European club rugby tournaments. We've got another European legend coming up shortly. But until then, from all of the team, goodbye.